Hello, I'm Pastor Robinson. Welcome to the Breath of Life Crusade series from Phoenix, Arizona. Through these videotapes, you will experience the entire evangelistic crusade featuring the preaching of Dr. Charles D. Brooks. As you follow along, may I encourage you to have your Bible, pen, and paper ready to jot down the texts which might be helpful to you. May God bless you now as we study together. We call it the question man, and I'm not he. Pastor Ortiz is the question man, but we answer your questions. Now, if you have questions, write them out on a piece of paper and get them to him or to an usher, and they will get them to him. We'll do our best to answer your questions every night. We'll try to answer them the very night you have asked them. We don't know everything. If we don't know the answer, we'll tell you. We'll be honest with you. We'll find an answer if it can be found in the Bible. There is something we request, however. Please do not ask questions that will reflect on persons or religions. Please don't do that. We want to be very discreet in what we do. And now to show you how it goes, we've collected a few questions. You have some, don't you, Pastor? Let's go with them. All right, the first question. Is it true that when a man dies, it just had to be because his time had come. You know, I have heard that all over the world. When you die, your time has come. I was in the country of Brasilia, and we had an escort who took us up on top of the Senate building, and there was a little narrow catwalk all the way across, maybe 12 or 15 stories high, to the house building. And the lady looked at me and said, Are you afraid to follow me across here? Well, you know men can't take that. I said, of course I'm not afraid. So I started across. The crazy thing is that when you got halfway, it did this. And it was frightening. In fact, when I got on the other side, I uttered a little prayer. I said, Lord, if you help me back across this thing, you won't have to answer this prayer again, ever. <laughs> but there was something she said that shook my confidence further. She said, Pastor, uh, a lot of folk are afraid. But I believe if you drop and you die, your time had come. I don't believe that. The Bible says, and here's the answer you want. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 17, Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is possible to be foolish or wicked and die before your time. If you get drunk and go out on the highway, drive 100 miles an hour, hit a tree and die, don't tell me your time had come. You had been foolish. Next, please. Pastor Brooks, do you believe it is true that if you are once saved, you can never be lost? That, that really is a very serious question. I'll tell you why. It is because it is a very pervasive idea and has become believed generally in Christendom today. That once you give your heart to the Lord, you cannot be saved. The Bible does not teach that. There are many things that are taught that are not scriptural. And I believe that unless it is found here, we are not bound to believe it. The Bible doesn't say that. I'll tell you what the Bible does say. It mentions backsliders. Now, the whole word would be obviated if this idea was true, that you're once saved and never lost. There could be no such thing as a backslider. That means you were once headed toward the kingdom and you slid back. That's what it means. In the book of Mark, the, the, the apostle said in chapter 13, he said that he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. But here is a text that I think will answer it very well. Second Peter chapter 2, I'm beginning with verse 20. It says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled. Did you get that? These are people who have escaped the pollutions of the world through Christ. But if they become again entangled, the Bible says, and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Verse 22, a very strong verse. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit 
again and the sow that's a female pig the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the Maya strong and graphic language a person who starts with the Lord and turns back and becomes entangled it is hard to win them back to the Lord and the Bible says they are like a dog that returns to its vomit and a sow that has been all cleaned up going back to the mud hole no it's not true once saved never lost you've got to endure by faith you've got to endure by holding on to Jesus you've got to endure by the force and power of prayer you've got to endure by sheer will surrendered to the will of God would you say amen if you believe that thank you next please Dr. Brooks, tell me, will too much religion drive you crazy? <laughs> I, it depends on what kind of religion you have. There are many religions but one Christianity. And perhaps some of these others could do it, but not the Word of God and not Christianity. Would you say amen? There's a favorite text found in the book of Psalms. It is the 19th Psalm and verse 7. And there it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Knowing and believing and studying and understanding the Word of God makes your mind keener. Two young men were in college. I know one. He's a relative. The other one was a, a Caucasian friend, and they both were straight-A students. But one day they had a very severe test, and the young man eked out a little bit higher than my relative. And so they were friends. He went to him. He said, tell me a secret. We both study. We both understand. And yet, on this one, you beat me. What is your secret? And the young man said, because you're sincere, I'm going to tell you. And he reached up and pulled down uh, the, the word of the Lord. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He said, I begin every day before I go to class with the word of God. You sharpen the mind. It comes alive. Students, you'll make better grades if you begin the day with Bible study and prayer. And you don't need a prayer law to do that. Thank you. Now, if you have questions, jot them down. Give them to an usher or to Pastor Ortiz and we'll take care of them for you as best we possibly can. Every night we'll have this little period to do that.
Thank you, Brother Wesley. And tonight I speak to you and to those who are watching by television a question that is coming up from time to time in private encounters and in large groups. The question is, has God lost control down here? As a matter of fact, it was put this way by one. If what these straight-laced preachers say is true, if God despises sin, and if he is all-powerful, how can he stand by so composed while crime and immorality and drugs run roughshod over humanity? How can God hold his peace? Is he really in charge? I was reading a family magazine the other day, and there was a picture of an atheist with a pair of scissors and a stack of paper currency. And everywhere he saw the words, in God we trust, he was cutting it out. I don't know what he did with the coins, but he felt he could cut out the words, in God we trust, such contempt for God, the same contempt that Satan has always had and that Satan has now. But I think, because of my own experience, O oh God, of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way. Ladies and gentlemen, without Him, I want to tell you the birds would go on strike. Their morning song would be struck from the record of our day. Without Him, the waves would cease to roll. Without Him, the oceans would sit in. Without Him, the sun would stand still and the moon would hide her face. Without God, the springs would run dry. Without God, all natural law would be abrogated. Without God, there would be total and immediate annihilation and doom such as we cannot dream of. It is a great comfort to me and I believe to many of you to know that God is there. If that's true, say amen. amen. A great comfort to know with men running wild and going mad that God is there. This is what gives real strength to our optimism. We read the Bible. We know God's word is true. And we know a better day is coming after a while. We know there's going to be a time when death shall die. And sin shall be cut off forever. And God's people will dwell safely. As the beautiful song says, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is God. Because he lives, because we know who holds the future, we can face uncertain days because he lives. Oh, whether we believe or not, God has been faithful to us. Our God never slumbers nor sleeps, the Bible declares. He does not need rest. He does not need a vacation. Whenever you need him, call him up by prayer. God is there. Heaven is open for business 24 hours a day. When many upon whom you depend are fast asleep, God is waiting, waiting to hear your prayer and to give the answer that best suits your case. So today as forever, there is a violent confrontation in the cosmos. There is another being out here his name is Satan, from the Hebrew word Hasatan, which means adversary. That being is just as real as God is. He's not as powerful as God is, but he is there. The first time he is mentioned as Satan is in the book of Job, chapter 1. It seems that the devil was there to represent this world at a council called by God. When you read Job, it's very interesting. The narrative is there. All of the sons of God come as representatives of the various worlds in his universe, and the devil comes amongst them. Isn't that interesting? 
Job portrays God as the CEO of the universe. And as it were, he calls a board meeting. And all of these representatives show up to answer to God and to discuss with God. And Satan came along, uninvited, but re not refused. Now Jesus said of him, he is the prince of this world. John 12 and verse 31. How did he become that? He usurped the position that Adam should have held forever. And he took over as prince of this world, at least temporarily. So there he was to represent the earth. God said to him, where did you come from? And he said, from walking to and fro in the earth. Doesn't that sound harmless? Well, I want to tell you where he walks. He leaves death and destruction in his train. Where did you come from? Why, I came from walking to and fro in the earth. I'm here to represent the earth. And then God said to him, have you considered my servant Job? If anybody ought to be here, it ought to be Job. He is perfect and upright. He eschews evil. That means he hates sin. Let me pause to tell you that this says to me, God ranks, God ranks a saint above principalities and powers. It gives us a clue as to how God feels about his children. God said to the devil, yes, you are powerful. You usurp the kingdom from Adam, but Job is the one who should be here. As a matter of fact, God was saying, Job is the kind of person that will eventually be put back in charge of the earth. For the Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now Satan answered God. He said, why shouldn't he be faithful to you? Look how you're paying. He is perhaps the richest man in society today. If you let me at him, I'll cause him to curse you to your face. He had to get permission. Oh, don't miss that. Whenever Satan comes with his blockbusters, he has to get permission. He cannot attack you. He cannot attack God's church unless God suffers him to do it for some high purpose. The devil said, let me have the privilege. He couldn't take it until God allowed it. No wonder the Bible says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above the, that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also provide a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. When the devil comes with his temptation, he has to put it on the scale. God has to weigh it. And if it's too heavy to be born, God says no. Whatever the trials are, God is there. His power is all powerful. Devil is nothing compared to him. And so he says to the devil, all right, go ahead and try Job, but don't touch his body. And ladies and gentlemen, immediately the stage was set. Satan ran out and got some of the wicked nations to help him. The Sabaeans came in and took all of Job's oxen and all of his sheep. And the fire came and burned up the rest. The Chaldeans came and stole his camels. Then there came a tornado, and the home where his children were celebrating together collapsed on them and killed every one of them, seven sons and three daughters. How many of us could stand such a thing? But here was the devil trying to make Job turn against God. And the point is, at that time, Job didn't even know he was a subject in this great test. God didn't ask his permission. And God doesn't have to ask ours. If we belong to him, he has a right to do with us as he pleases. God has a right to treat us as he pleases. And so here is Job. Having lost everything, destitute, bereft of everything, except a cynical wife. And Job cried out, the Lord giveth and the Lord take it away now. With apologies to inspiration, Job was a little bit wrong there. It is true the Lord giveth, but the devil taketh away. Would you say amen? amen. It is the devil that causes war. 
It is the devil that causes disease and sin and crime and all of these things that annoy us so much today. So we come to chapter 2. And there was another occasion when the representatives of God were called together. And Satan appeared again. He has lost his, his, his boast, but he's there again. And the questioning is the same. Where did you come from? From patrolling the earth. Well, how about you? You tested him. You took away everything that he has. How about him? Is he still faithful? You have not kept your promise. Job has not cursed me to my face. The devil said, aha, skin for skin. You take care of him. You let me touch his body and I'll make him do it. Amen. And finally God said, all right, but don't take his life. And suddenly this man broke out with boils from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Suddenly this man had what seemed to have been AIDS and leprosy combined. This man stank so badly he had to leave his home. He was revolting to look at. He went out on the trash heap and sat amongst the ashes. He took a pot's herd and began to scrape the ooze from his body. You could smell him from many yards away. Job was in an awful shape. His wife didn't even want to come near him. She said to him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? You mean you're still going to be faithful? You're still going to be a child of God? Why don't you curse God and die? Job said, Dear wife, you sound like a foolish woman. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. I will not turn against my God. He is merciful. He is still God. I do not understand what I'm going through, but he is still there. I will not lose faith. We need to understand the role that Satan plays in this world, giving God credit for the evil things that he does. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, the Bible says. The devil is a deceiver. He will make eyes at you. He will grin in your face. He will tempt you one way or the other. And when he gets you into trouble, he'll stand back and laugh at you. The devil is no friend. And he blames God for all the troubles we seem to have. But when we come to the prophecies of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says there was war in heaven. And the dragon, verse 9 tells you that's the devil, fought against the Son of God with all of his angels, and the devil lost. Oh, thank God the devil lost. He has never won. When you stand on the Lord's side, you're standing on the side of a champion. You're on a winning team when you stand with the Lord. The devil was kicked out of heaven after that war was fought, and his angels were thrown out with him. He was forbidden re-entry, but he did have access to the universe. And he went amongst the stars to spread his filth in outer space. But then the Savior came. He met the devil on his own turf. He gave him, as they say in sports, the home field advantage. Jesus came down and met the devil and defeated him without weapons except the weapon of prayer and the sharp sword of the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, eventually the time came when the devil had Christ arrested, treated him awfully bad, beaten and, and, and spat upon, and, and the blood and the sweat and the spit mingled together and ran down his countenance. What a way to treat the Son of God. And then they nailed him to a cross, lifted that cross up into place and let it drop into a hole prepared for it with a sickening thud ripping open further the hands and the feet of the Son of God. And the devil exulted. He thought, surely I have now won against this Son of God. And they had him put in a tomb. And the devil told his courts, make sure this tomb is kept secure. Don't let anybody come and steal him. For if they did, they will spread the word that he's risen from the dead. So they rolled a huge stone in front of the tomb. And they sealed it with Roman mortar. 
and they put a Roman guard there to keep the disciples away and we are told by the pen of inspiration the devil and his imps also surrounded the tomb trying to keep Jesus in you know I heard an old gospel preacher say this one time uh, with the imagery that you can expect from the black preacher he said that he imagined a dialogue between death and hell hell being Hades the grave and death said to Hades I have delivered him to you now can you keep him and the grave answered don't worry I've got him I'm all sealed up he can't get out and nobody can get in and so Friday evening Christ was in the tomb all day Saturday Christ was in the tomb and death came again and cried to hell the grave have you still got him and the grave answered don't worry I've got him he's here he has not moved I've got him Saturday night death began to get a little anxious he had read the words of Christ that after three days I will rise again and he thought I'd better go check one more time so he came on that Saturday night and he said to hell is he still there and hell answered I've got him he is still here the grave is secure but then came early Sunday morning All right. <laughs> and an angel came down from heaven faster than the inconceivable velocity of sound or sight and as that angel entered our sphere there was a great earthquake and the mortar was cracked and an angel came and rolled that stone away and Jesus had already risen yeah. he got up from the grave as he said he would he didn't need any angel to bring him from the dead he said I lay down my life and I take it up again and when Jesus walked out of that tomb he defeated the devil's best weapon yeah. Revelation 12 says therefore rejoice ye heavens this time is plural not just heaven where God is from which he was born but the heavens everywhere no longer can he promenade amongst the stars therefore rejoice ye heavens but then it says in Revelation 12 woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time the devil is furious that's why he keeps us distracted with crying that's why he keeps us distracted with drugs and foolishness and immorality and perversion he is working furiously because he knows he has but a short time he wants us to think we've got plenty of time the devil's headquarters the earth he cannot go anywhere else and he is wreaking havoc down here in the past it seemed that in spite of the fact that he is here he wore a bridle with a bit and that God guided him and held him back but now it almost seems like he's been turned loose to do his thing I'd be honest with you I'm one of those from the transitional generation the old and the new and I am amazed at what I see today I can hardly believe what they bring on television right into your living room today you don't have to drive down to the red light district in order to do wrong it is brought right into the finest homes in the suburbs the most asinine foolishness you can possibly imagine paraded as entertainment and all of it is corrupting the minds of those who sit and watch it by the hour the devil is furious if he's got you thinking about that you will not think about getting ready for the coming of our Lord if he's got your mind wrapped up in that you will not be thinking about prayer meeting and the need to pray to pray wherever you are it seems that he has turned himself loose and therefore the question has God lost control but I want to tell you again in the words of the sports writers these are the playoffs the end is very near and the devil has got people proclaiming wrong as though it were right and condemning right as though it were wrong the devil camouflages sin so that you don't recognize it for what it is God used plain language God called it drunkenness we call it alcoholism God calls it sodomy we call it homosexuality God calls it perversion we call it adult entertainment 
God calls it an abomination. We call it an alternate lifestyle. As a matter of fact, the devil chose a very innocuous word. It's called gay. Now, I ought to tell you that God loves homosexuals because God loves sinners. But homosexuality is the sin, and God hates sin. So don't condemn all homosexuals. A homosexual can be saved just like a drunkard can be saved. The drunkard has to give up his drinking. The homosexual has to give up homosexuality. But God loves him and will save him, but will not save him in his homosexuality. You can call it gay or whatever you want to call it. It will not happen. Gay. I told somebody the other day, when I was a boy, I was young and I was happy and gay. Today, I'm just happy. Satan camouflaging sin. There is the resulting crime. There is the resulting sodomy. And there is the resulting affliction called AIDS. Things that are against the law are being tolerated and accepted and condoned. And others don't even care. They want to be indifferent. The Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. And I'm sorry to tell you that throughout this land, pulpits have lost their name. And men are unwilling to stay what God believes and what God teaches and what God demands. And then there is this radical feminism. I, I really don't mind being quoted. I just hate to be misunderstood. I have always been, I have always been a believer in women's lives. My wife is the principal of a large school, about 65 people, including janitors under her direct control. Gifted, talented, I've always believed in that. I believe in equal pay for equal work. I believe in equal representation. I believe in equal uh, credit for equal preparation. I always, I don't have an uneasy vanity. Women are not beneath or inferior. If anything, they're superior. Most states declare them grown at 18. Men have to wait till they're 21. They make better grades in school. They can stand more pain. They have a thing called intuition that's out of this world. And they live longer than we do. Don't ever look down your nose at a woman. I'm talking about radical feminism. A woman by the name of Kate Millett wrote a book called Sexual Politics. And in that book she said, the family must go. It oppresses and enslaves women. Ladies and gentlemen, the idea of marriage was God's idea. So here is a woman saying God was wrong. We don't need marriage anymore. It enslaves women. God's idea, they're ready to cast out the window. And God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Therefore made the woman to be in help meet for him. And that doesn't mean help meet expenses. It means she is a companion. One to sit with him in judgment. One to be there with him in marriage. To protect man from himself. She is there so that men and women can live higher than an animal. She is there for the protection of children. She is there to keep her husband from disease and from corrupting himself, from doing the very things that are being popularized on television today. Wouldn't you think, wouldn't you think that somebody, somebody would be wise enough to see that man's ways do not work? Amen. Every time we follow our own inclinations, we get into trouble. Wouldn't you think somebody would say, wait a minute, God is right. His way is the best way. There's also a teaching that I'm hearing more and more that you ought not allow anything or anyone to direct your life. Whatever is legal is moral. Have you heard that? Whatever is legal is moral. During World War II, and I lived during that, the Nazis put to death millions upon millions of people. And when they came to trial at Nuremberg, over and over and over again, their defense was, we broke no laws. 
but they were obeying the corrupt, murderous laws of men. Six million Jews, three million Russians, a million Poles, and along with them, handicapped people, demented people, Jehovah's Witnesses, they put them to death by the millions and yet said, we broke no laws. Whatever is legal, therefore, they claim is moral. Ladies and gentlemen, because of philosophy like this, our nation and our world are cascading down into a morass of moral darkness. There's hardly anywhere to go to hear the truth anymore. There's hardly anywhere to go to be corrected in our lifestyle anymore. And crime and drugs and immorality are making life miserable for us down here. Then we think of murder. When you look at the rate of killings in our country today, intelligent society, we do things that animals will not do. I read somewhere that two wolves will fight. And if one is beaten, he rolls over on his back and exposes his throat for the kill. The other wolf, seeing that, will walk away. A human being won't. A human being will shoot you and kill you. Down in Washington, where I live, some young men were out riding on Sunday afternoon. One of them pulled a gun out of his belt and said, I feel like killing somebody. Just like he was saying, I feel like some ice cream. He rolled down the window and shot a handsome woman recently married and she fell over dead into her husband's lap. What in the world is going on down here? Our schools have become war zones. Every day you read about it. Policemen are parading and patrolling the halls of our schools. In one classroom a child aged 15 walked into the chemistry lab, took out a gun, and shot to death several people before they could control him. Teenagers can rent Uzis. Those are machine guns. Teenagers can rent them along with the appropriate bulletproof vest. Children with guns. Children going down the street murdering indiscriminately. Even little ones. What a world we've come to live in. And then there is war. When we see war today, it's so degraded, it's so awful. Well, it always has been, but it seems worse today. We have watched the Russians against those in Chechnya. We have watched over there in Croatia. We have watched this group against that group. War goes on all the time. And today, weak and maddened leaders have weapons of unimaginable destruction, and we don't even know about it. Then we consider politics and wonder, is God in charge? Politics today have degenerated into something awful in my judgment. Politicians are willing to prostitute themselves for votes. They don't do what they think they should anymore. They do what they think the public will appreciate. And ladies and gentlemen, the Spirit of God is gradually being withdrawn from the earth. And we are living in times of unprecedented wrath and trouble. But I have an announcement I want to make. God is still in charge. Amen. God is still on his throne. He has not, he will not yield control. He is still the mighty God. Amen. He is still answering prayer. He is still protecting his children. That's why you're able to be here tonight in health and strength. He is still saving lost men and women. He is still holding down destruction. He is still the friend of sinners. He still gives us food to eat and puts shoes on our feet. God is still God and he's still in charge of this earth. No matter what men do. He sits behind the scenes, at the wheel, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. In the history of nations, men rose up and tried to take charge, to take control from God, and they met with failure. Pharaoh did it when he followed the Jews into the Red Sea, and his whole army was drowned. Nebuchadnezzar did it 
when he threw the three Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace and had to learn a hard lesson. Belshazzar did it when he had a big party one night and brought out the vessels from the temple of God that they might drink their wine. And they left the paint of their lips and the slime of their throats on God's vessels until a hand wrote on the wall the doom of that nation. Then there was Herod who assumed the prerogatives of a God and sentenced Christ to death. That man died a madman with worms eating his body even before death came to give him relief. Ladies and gentlemen, God says in Hosea 4, beginning with verse 1, The Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. In Psalm, the second chapter, and verse 1, those words that we hear in Handel's Messiah, why do the nation so furiously rage together? And why do the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth rise up. And the people take counsel together against the Lord. But the Lord shall have them in derision. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, the day is coming. Make no mistake about it, the day is coming. Payday someday. God has not yielded control. Though the people rage together and imagine a vain thing, the Bible teaches that eventually God's day will come and he will have them in derision. He that sitteth in the heavens will laugh at them. But what about these times? In John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. He's talking to his believers. He's talking to those tonight who might even be sinners but are inclined toward becoming Christians. He's talking to those who are tired of the ways they have been following. He's talking to those who are tired of the burden of sin. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Did you hear that? Over 300 times in the New Testament, he talked about it. I will come again. Paul called it the blessed hope. I will come again. He has not lost control. And when he comes, he comes to take completely the control that Satan seems to have. In the book of Isaiah chapter 24, the Bible says when he comes, the earth shall be utterly broken down and moved exceedingly. It shall run or reel to and fro like a drunkard. It shall be removed like a cottage. It shall fall and not rise again. Jesus is coming. He said he would. He wants us to get ready for that eventuality. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing on earth today more important than getting ready for the coming of our Lord. Tomorrow night we will learn that his coming is nearer than most people believe. The Bible gives us indications. We do not set dates. The Bible does not give a date. But the Bible to us does tell us when his coming is near. We are living in what the Bible calls the end of earth's history. Soon and very soon, Jesus will come down and the reign of sin shall be cut off. Satan will be gone forever and eventually destroyed both root and branch. There shall be peace in the valley. Peace in the valley. The earth will be made new. Jesus will come. And those who have made a covenant with him by sacrifice will live for him and with him forever, never again, to know pain or sorrow or death. In closing, we're going to go to the screen for just a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you just to think on these things. Has God lost control? The answer is obvious to those who study the prophecies of God's Word. We have considered tonight crime. This is an age of unprecedented crime. People no longer even want to work for what they desire. They think they have a right to take it. I was in a line one day and heard two men talking and they call themselves professional criminals. It's their 
employment. It's their vocation. It's their job. They feel they have a right to work. A right to take what you have. What an age. Men today walk into banks, walk into places where money is kept, and these men feel they have a right to harass and brutalize and even murder anybody who gets in their way. And they take away that which they have not earned. This is the kind of world we are living in today. A world characterized by crime. I want you just to look at some of these. It says murder records are spreading more in big cities. Every morning when I'm at home, we turn on the news after devotions. And you hear of three or four people who have been gunned down that night every day. We don't miss a day. And it's true in many of the other large cities throughout this country. Violence is becoming a part of our culture. Do you know what the Bible said? Jesus gave signs, and we'll talk about it tomorrow night, concerning his coming. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And when you go back to the story of Noah, the Bible says succinctly, and the earth was filled with violence. So what do we see? We see the Word of God coming true. That's what we see. Someone even characterized our nation as America, the violence. Violence lurks on every street. I told my wife one day, when we first moved to the area of the nation's capital, I used to get home some days and take my dog and go for a long walk out in the woods. I wouldn't do that anymore. Nobody with good sense would do that anymore. I used to love to take my children by the hand and walk them the same way. Go down by the creek, let them dance across the stones. Not anymore. Violence characterizes our very culture. Then there is arson. Teen girl guilty of stabbing a man 60. These are the headlines you tend to read almost every day. A garage rapist gets seven years. This is someone who went out to the garage, their own garage, and someone was lurking nearby and abused and brutalized a good woman. Children are being killed. I read the other day, 2,000 babies a year die at the hands of their own parents. What kind of world is this? A mother takes her children, puts them in a car, fastens a seatbelt, and drives them into a lake, and then pretends that somebody else did it. And the whole nation is weeping for her. We should weep for those children. Weep for those children. And then fear. This is a world characterized by fear. I, someone said even watches seem to tick faster than they used to. <laughs> Certainly hearts beat faster. And people are taking aspirin tablets by the gallons. But we've got a problem that aspirin cannot cure. A world also characterized by fear. Fear stalks the streets. You know it's true. People are afraid to walk the street, afraid to drive. You've heard of carjacking in Phoenix? It happens. Sitting in a red light, a man comes, puts a gun to your head, tells you to get out, takes your car. It's worse if he tells you to stay in. This is an awful world. People are afraid of their shadows anymore. And when people are like that, their nerves are on edge. They don't like each other. They are easily agitated and irritated. Therefore, violence spreads amongst people because they are less tolerant. They are less tolerant because they are afraid. What a world we live in today. Young people are afraid. And then there's immorality. I'm not going to say a lot about this, but it's out of control. I remember when we were young marrieds uh, a good while ago. We used to go up to New York and, and we were amazed, having come from small towns, to look at the great city. And then we were not there for 30 years. And one day, that is walking down those streets, and one day a man had us in his car, and he said, let me take you down by Times Square. And when we got down there, I saw my wife reach over and lock the door. And lock the door. The immorality I could not tell you about in mixed company. I wouldn't want to tell you in any company. That's the kind of world we live in. And because of it, the whole nation is reeking now. AIDS has become the biggest killer of women, even ahead of heart attacks. You sow to the wind, 
you reap the whirlwind. Drugs. All of these things destroying us. And then war. We're going to close, I guess, with this one. War. War. It's part of our nature. We like to fight them and then write books about them. As though it's romantic. As, as a matter of fact, that word is used in connection with war. The romance of war. Men go off to college and are trained in killing. We know how to blow up nations. We know how to destroy masses. We know how to fly in the heavens like a bird, to swim in the water like a duck, to swim under the water like a submarine. But we don't know how to live together. To respect and love one another. War, I said. What a dreadful thing. We live in fear because you don't know when it's going to break out. You don't know when it's going to come home to our wonderful land. But Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Now listen, I, I want to make something clear to you. This isn't just something I preach. This is something I experience. I can go to bed at night after prayer and sleep like a baby. Why? Because God is in charge. And he has said this to me personally, Charles, let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because you believe in God. Then believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going away, and if I go away, I will come again. Let everybody say amen to that. Today you hear that, and you think of some religious zealot, or some fanatic. No, 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 no. Jesus said that. And if we respect him at all, if we believe in him at all, let us then believe that he will not just do part of what he says, he will keep all of his promises. He said, I go away and I'm coming back again. Why are you coming, Lord? Oh, he said, I've got reasons. I'm coming to wake up the righteous dead. I'm coming to gather my saints. I'm coming to evacuate them. We got a people talking about saving this world. This world doesn't need saving. It needs destroying. People need saving. And Jesus is coming to save his people. And he's going to get them out of here. Amen. Ours, as a friend of mine says, is an evacuation message. And it comes from the word of God. It's not about making this world wonderful. It's about getting out of here when Jesus comes. So that he can make it over again. And then the meek shall inherit the earth. He said, I will come again. That's why we preach. He said, tell it to everyone, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And finally, he's going to ring down the curtain. Earth's last war has a very dramatic name. That name is found in Scripture. But let me tell you, I see it in the newspapers. I read it from scientists. Men who think are talking about Armageddon. They know that this world can't stand very much more. Armageddon, showdown time. Armageddon, when the Lord wrenches from the hand of the devil complete control. Armageddon, when men who have put their fists in the face of God are finally conquered and the meek shall rise up and inherit the earth. Armageddon is not far away. But the good news is, the Lord has worked things out so that you and I may be saved. We like to think about it on that night when he prayed. He prayed until his pores ruptured and blood poured through his skin. Jesus was wrestling with the forces of hell. Why? Because he had his mind on you and on me. He didn't need that for himself. He suffered for you and for me. And after a night of suffering, he was arrested and taken before men, creatures, the Creator being judged by creatures, the Son of God, those powerful hands bound like a common criminal, and men sitting in judgment on God. They still do. And Jesus stood as a man, refusing even to answer, and Pontius Pilate finally turned him over to the mob. Do with him as you will, but I wash my hands. It's not that easy, Pilate. Not that easy to wash your hands of Jesus. Tonight you've heard from Jesus the word of God. 
You can't go home and wash your hands now. We are responsible. We are responsible. If we do nothing, we are still responsible. That man could not get rid of the blood of Christ so easily. And so he consigned Jesus to the mob. And they took him out on a place called Calvary. And they nailed him to a tree. And they planted him there between God and man, the Son of God. Those drops of blood pulsated out from around the nail. They ran down his arm and down through the splinters of the cross and actually saturated the ground beneath him. That blood, that blood, that fountain of cleansing, that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Jesus went through that for you and for me. Tonight, I want you to go out of here with your mind on the cross. That tells us that if you want to be saved, you may. Doesn't matter how long you've used drugs. Doesn't matter how long you've run on the devil's team. Doesn't matter how rotten you have been in society. Doesn't matter how much liquor you have drunk, how many drugs you've taken. If you will to do God's will, there is power in the blood. Focus on the cross. And when you look at Jesus dying, get an idea of how valuable you are to him. He died for you. The door is open for you. His voice is calling for you. His salvation is available for you. His help is ready for you. His angels will serve for you. The Son of God has done this for you. But what I like to end with when I talk about his death is the fact that he didn't stay dead. He conquered death, walked out of that tomb, and with mighty and holy scorn, he turned and looked back at the tomb. And with a curl on his lips, the curl of a champion who has been successful, Jesus said, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Christ has won. Hallelujah. Christ has won. And he won for every one of us. Jesus has opened the doors of salvation to us all. And he's coming soon. Coming to get those who want to go home with him. Jesus is coming. And when he comes, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to look up and see him come. We're going to see that cloud coming closer and closer until its base is a consuming fire. And the earth will move like a drunkard. Mountains will skip away. Camelback will move out of its place. Islands will be swallowed up. John the Revelator saw it in vision and he cried out, Who shall be able to stand? But I want to tell you, there will be those who can stand. Those who decided in time, those who came to Jesus for salvation, those who made up their minds that by his grace he would do, their, he'd do the will of God, they will be able to stand. They will be able to live when Jesus comes. I want to see him when he comes, and I want to see him in peace because he's going to come in peace for those who love him and for those who don't. He's a mighty God of war. John said he had a sickle in his hand and a voice cried, thrust in thy sickle. He's going to start cutting to the right and cutting to the left. He will reap the harvest of earth. He will gather the wheat in his garner and the tares will be bound together for burning. I want to be ready when Jesus comes, ladies and gentlemen. Don't you? I ask you, don't you? If you really do, if even tonight there is a new surge in your heart, a new desire to be ready for he's coming soon, I have not given you cunningly devised fables. I have told you the truth from God's word. Christ will come. He said so. And he cannot lie. If you really mean that you want to be ready by his grace, with his help, washed in his blood, then I want you to stand right now with your heads bowed. If you're in the other auditorium, stand now with your heads bowed and let us pray. 
Oh, my dear Father, we thank you for this beginning of our series of meetings here. We thank you for gathering with us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Without him, we would be eternally hopeless. Without him, we would be destroyed already. We thank you that Jesus came and gave his life. We thank you that he died the death that we should have died. I heard it sung so beautifully today. We should have been crucified. We should have suffered and died. God gave his son to die in our stead. We thank you for that tonight and that you've opened up a way by which we can be saved in your kingdom. We who are weak, we who make so many mistakes, we who have stumbled and fallen so many times, we who have tried and failed, you've made a way of salvation for us. And with all of our hearts, we thank you. And now, Lord, I'm looking at this congregation, and you are looking too. You know every one of us. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you will fortify each soul and each decision and each determination. Give us the power and the resolution to do what we know we ought to do. Help us to put God first. And then when you come, when the trumpet sounds, and the earth must give up her dead, when the righteous rise and are called to meet you in the clouds, those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. Oh, my Father, don't leave us down here, but please take us home with you. Let us be there to enjoy eternity with Jesus and with each other. We ask it not because we're worthy, but in the name of someone who is, in the name of our Savior. Church, there is someone who cares when sin gets out of hand. There is someone who cares when vice corrupts the land. There is someone who cares and he will give you grace to stand for that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares when you just can't behave. There is someone who cares when sin has made you a slave. There is someone who cares, and he is mighty to save. For that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. We ask it in the name of our beautiful Savior who loves us all. And for his sake, let everyone say amen.